you. Um, so I am a professor at the University of Washington, Tacoma, which is just about 30 minutes south of here when there's no traffic. Um, and I teach primarily in the Masters of Geospatial Technology. Um, and so that is why I have an overly academic title for this presentation. Um, but it is uh, intentional. So whenever I tell people I, I work with drones, um, you just see their face change. And through the media and these images we're getting online, like people automatically think militarization and drones are just associated with negative uh, connotations. Um, we also know that um, maps hold power. And maps have been used for imperialism. Maps have been used to take over new lands and claim ownership. Um, so th this is where I'm, where I'm coming from. Maps have power. Um, greater weight is given to knowledge expressed in quantitative forms um, and also represented in uh, cartographic forms. So uh, Tyler did a great presentation talking about all of these different indicators we use in different governmental organizations and intergovernmental organizations. Um, and aerial imagery is particularly seen as authoritative and seen as truth. Um, but we know that when we get imagery from the government or from Google or from anywhere else, that truth is set in that time that that image was taken. So we're constrained by the, the imagery that we are able to um, access from governmental organizations. And then through OSM, we, this is the imagery we use to then create the vectors. To, we digitize vectors based on this imagery, so it's extremely valuable. And right now, with, in the state of volunteer geographic information, we're contributing largely vectors, not rasters. Um, and in, in the media, when we do see drones adapted for mapping, it's primarily for disaster response, um, environmental monitoring by highly trained scientists, um, precision agriculture and human, humanitarian efforts. So now I'm gonna go through and show some um, exciting images of these examples. Um, but first, it's important to recognize that disaster isn't just disaster response. There are many phases to a disaster. It's a, it's a cycle. So in a disaster, there's you should be prepared, hopefully. Hopefully we're all prepared. <laughs> preparedness is the most important. Um, there's also before preparedness mitigation, so hard path solutions in terms of trying to prevent the negative ramifications from an, an event. Then you have the actual event, and that's when the response kicks in. Um, and so we all know how maps are really important for res response, and then maps can be used again for the resilience, getting a community back on its feet. Um, and also, different people have different spatial data needs during different phases of a disaster. Um, and it's really important to recognize that. It's not just for response. So a local example of how um, imagery was really helpful for both environmental scientists to understand a phenomenon, but also for disaster response was the Oso landslide. So this is the before imagery, um, and then this is the after imagery. So this was back in March of... Um, 2014, and this was a really big event where drones were used heavily. Um, again, you can slide back and forth through the imagery. Um, one woman who does a lot of work with zones for disaster response, her name is Robin Murphy. Um, she has a fantastic TED Talk. She was highly active in the Oso landslide. And she concludes her TED Talk with, it's not about the robots. We have the robots. It's about the data and delivering the data to the right people in a timely fashion. So that's really the big challenge. Um, precision agriculture is one um, industry that has made remarkable progress in terms of delivering timely information to farmers. Um, the Mica Sense is a local company who develops a um, multispectral sensor that can be mounted to drones. Um, and they have exciting um, examples of how you can identify a tree in the middle of an orchard that's diseased that you wouldn't otherwise see without this technology. Um, so we can learn from these other, other, uh, ex other industries. Um, example of humanitarian uh, response. And then, of course, HOT. HOT we had a lot of talks from. But so we know how beneficial drones are. Why aren't more people using them um, regularly? Well, it, they're hard. It's hard. You need technical know-how to process the, the data, to buy the data, to buy the software to do the data processing. So it's, it's hard. But some of these barriers are coming down. 
um, drones are becoming more prevalent. They're more accessible. So this access to imagery is, this is a barrier that's, uh, we're overcoming. So drone enthusiasts now can contribute aerial imagery that is so authoritative and valuable. And so on the bottom are some screenshots of um, my classmates or my, my students and I flying. And I'm really excited about pushing my research towards how can citizens generate their own aerial imagery that is so authoritative? Why would they want to do this? Well, the temporal resolution, you can fly over more often and get that granularity you need to monitor continuous or acute changes in a landscape. Spatial re resolution, increased coverage. There are so many reasons why this could be valuable. Um, and I specifically have been working with um, the Phantom because it's the most common, it's the most popular drone out there. So I'm intentionally using that one because it's accessible. Um, but, you know, Jane Doe, enthusiast, drone flyer, how does she take these images that she's catching with her drone and turn them into um, an orthorectified photo? That's, that's the challenge. So it's, there's several steps involved to get from that flight to that ortho photo. Um, so first you have the flight, assuming you don't crash into anything and you land it safely and everything goes well. Um, and then that the appropriate metadata is attached to each one of your images. Then you can then stitch the images um, and create a geotiff. Um, I saw Stephen Mather around here. He has an amazing software called Open Drone Map that generates geotiffs, but also 3D models and all these other exciting byproducts. Then where are you going to store the data? Um, as an educator, I'm most excited about the analysis and teaching my students how to analyze the data that's captured. And then there's the aggregation piece, and then sharing the information with the relevant stakeholders. Now, to do each one of these steps, you need multiple different people, or you need multiple different software systems. So I just did, took a random sample of software required to do each one of these steps, and then I highlighted the open source ones. <laughs> so we have open drone map, and then you'll notice that there's only one on there that is focusing on the sharing and aggregation, which is so important to our open source community. And that is Open Aerial Map. Now, has anyone used Open Aerial Map before? Okay, well, if you need any imagery or you have any imagery to contribute, I highly recommend checking it out. Um, so this is actually the second iteration of um, Open Aerial Map. It started in about um, 2007 and then kind of tapered off in, in 2008. Um, and it's a project powered and opened uh, by open, the Open Image Imagery Network. And now I really think it's going to take off because the technology has been shifting so quickly and more people have drones and we see this need for um, more raster data. There's more of an opportunity con to contribute raster data. Um, and some, I just want to give a hat tip to some of the key contributors. Um, there's far more involved in, I, you know, I'm, I'm a user, not a con contributor. I mean, I've contributed um, imagery, but I'm really in all of the, the work that's been done here. So here, here's uh, an example of, there's a browser, there's an uploader, there's a catalog of imagery, the tiler. And then this is what the user interface looks like. So it's really quite easy to use. You can zoom to the region that you're interested in um, either contributing or extracting imagery. And then it shows you what imagery is available. Um, so you can see here that there's a lot of satellite imagery from the government. And there's also uh, one geotiff from a drone. So OAM is a, a unique platform that we could actually be sharing data. So you have governmental data being pushed. Um, down from the top down, and then the grassroots efforts pushing data into this database to be shared together to augment each other. Um, and now I want to talk about two examples from my own research that I haven't used OAM exclusively, but I can see how OAM could really, really help in these efforts. Um, so first, you know the REM song, Stand in the Place Where You Live. Yeah. So, drone the place you live. <laughs> um, so this is, a, a, I had a student call me and say, hey, there was a, a landslide, um, and it would be really helpful if you could come take recent imagery of this landslide. So the red dots indicate where each image was taken, and then they were stitched together, and here's a, a picture of the landslide. 
then we were able to take previous imagery to monitor, well, was this an acute change or was this a continuous landslide? Did, was there any um, land use change that may have contributed to this landslide? Oh, hey, wait, there's a deck that slid down the cliff and it appears they didn't, they might not have had a permit for that deck. Um, so having this type of imagery and generating yourself can really help you make informed decisions about your own backyard. Uh, Martha Stewart regularly drones her yard to make, to help with this decision-making process. That's right. Good job, Martha Stewart. <laughs> But the imagery that we have, we don't really know the whole story. We're constrained by the timestamps that are available. Um, a second case that I want to talk about, um, really, uh, it's very similar to a lot of the things that Tyler was mentioning. So last summer, um, I went to Cape Town, South Africa, to work uh, to learn a little bit more about um, their open data practices. So Cape Town is the first municipality in all of Africa to release open data. Um, they were a city, they were selected as the global city of design in 2014, and um, they released open data as part of that um, process. So the orange is my GPX tracks, and uh, the white is OS OSM, in Cardo, in Cardo, not Cardo DB, Cardo. Um, and then if you zoom out, you can see, okay, there's some communities around, um, not much going on. But then when you turn on the imagery, it's like, oh, actually, there's a lot going on. Um, so Cape Town is a very complex uh, place. Um, so there's formal settlements and informal settlements. So I was walking in the informal settlements. Um, and you can see that people there are, um, they don't own the land but they are homeowners. They're not landowners, but they are homeowners. Um, and so they, this is what it, it, it looks like when you're walking through the community. This is the open data, the parcel data, that you over, when you overlay the information on the digital imagery. Um, so there is some missing information in the open data repository. And now all of us, as part of the open, um, open street map community, we have a role to play in this. In this. Um, we risk reproducing inequalities, and um, Sarah Elwood from University of Washington, she calls us for active engagement to combat inequalities through modern forms of map making. So this is a really unique opportunity for each of us. So there's actually, in that community I was visiting, there's a, a non-governmental organization called Violence Prevention Through Urban Upgrading, and they're working with the community, similar to what Tyler was talking about, where they digitize each of the rooftops. So just because they don't own the land, they do own the, the four walls that they have, or they have um, erected for their family. And so in this process, they've taught the community how to use QGIS, um, and then the, each each house is given a very formalized certificate um, saying who lives in the dwelling, how many people. It's kind of like a deed, too. If the person dies, this is who it's left to. Um, and it can be used for setting up bills. It's, it's a formalized process. And so this is another opportunity where the government can share data and then the community can share data and it can be put together. This is a theoret theoretical thing, but it would be amazing. And I think OAM could be one of the platforms. So bringing it back to OAM and UAVs, um, if you don't have the before imagery, if you don't have temporal, uh, consistent temporal resolution, the imagery might be less useful. Um, Drones prevent, provide an opportunity to monitor gradual, acute, continuous changes, all of the above, and in regions that are important to you. Um, and it's an opportunity to forge new relationships with um, authoritative sources, but also with drone enthusiasts. So I had a, uh, a talk with Seth Fitzsimmons in preparation for this talk. Thank you, Seth, if you're here. Um, and he was saying, um, well, as an educator, so I go to OAM just to find imagery a lot. Well, like, what would be, what would be helpful? And so uh, in the future, it would be awesome if you could search by sensor, if you could search by temporal resolution, by spatial extent. Um, and it was funny because my, my needs as an educator really matched the needs that were already on GitHub. So that, that was validating. <laughs> Um, and this is like the dream wish list. It wouldn't it be amazing if you could also, if OAM also had like image recognition? That would be awesome if it was already built in. Um, so Terra Pattern, has anyone played with this? It's incredible. So it's like it's image recognition and you can monitor um, changes in satellite imagery. Um, I'm collaborating a little bit with the fire department in Tacoma. Uh, 
plug for his talk tomorrow. The fire chief will be talking tomorrow. Um, it would be really, he was saying how it would be really interesting if we could monitor where um, fuel uh, fuel compartments are and image recognition could do that. That'd be awesome. Um, in browser analysis, has anyone played with Snapstat? So you can make false color composites just in your browser, like in a snap. It's pretty awesome. I highly recommend it. It's really fun. Um, but for a more realistic recommendation, I mean, I think this is starting to happen a little bit on its own, but if there was social networking between the people who have the drones versus the people who have the expertise to, to stitch the imagery or have the software to do that and start a dialogue because not everyone needs to do every single step. So it would be great if there was some social network in in, so we could share the workload and share resources. And I think, again, OAM is a great platform for that. Um, we can also learn from others. So these are not open source uh, programs, but I'm, I'm really interested to see how this one plays out. Um, phones and drones. So Drone Deploy is a software where you can upload imagery and it stitches it for you. And the Nature Conservancy. So they're having people fly the coastline and then other people with phones digitize some of the important information. So I think it's just something to keep an eye on and maybe learn from. And I'm just going to... One more plug for this idea of sharing data. The workflow is important to make informed decision together. And to kind of tie it all together, maybe an alternative title for this talk is like accommodating UAV imagery in the spatial data infrastructure for a two-way decision support tool. That's kind of what I'm what I'm alluding to here. Um, and my, I have a colleague, his name's Craig Dalton, and he's given guest lectures in my class about counter mapping. Well, what is counter mapping? Counter to what? And it's just something to think about. So I just want to have this open-ended question, like, what is hegemony? Is it the crowd? Is it the government? Is it something else? I don't know. But just something for you to think about, too. And the ideal, as an educator and an academic, I can be idealistic. So I think more, more data, more eyes will lead to more learning, I hope. Um, and experiential learning, I'm hoping that will also lead to informed decision-making and informed policy-making. Um, and with that, I thank you for listening to my talk. Any questions? Yes. So is there an effort to um, make this more rural oriented in the sense that, you know, a lot of the data we have by, um, by how it's generated is more urban focused. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a lot of urban data and especially with drones, you know, people with drones probably, especially like, you know, civilians live in areas that are more urban. Mm -hmm. So is there a way that you guys want to expand this into rural areas for rural mapping? Um, population mapping, infrastructure mapping, other types yeah, of Yeah, my, my goal with my research is really just to come up with a workflow that can be recommended to others. So, so anyone can go buy a relatively inexpensive drone and then use it whatever needs they have. Um, so that, that would be a great idea. And I know there is a lot of, of work, work being done in that regard in terms of uh, rural mapping. But it's mostly for, for agriculture, for what I, from what I've been reading recently. Um, but that would be fascinating. Can, do you have a project in mind? Or? No, I mean, I, I, mean, I noticed that there's a lot of uh, lack of information about infrastructure in rural areas, mm -hmm. especially in developing uh, parts of the world. So, I mean, I'm guessing if you leave this uh, methodology alone, it'll mostly focus on uh, mm -hmm. either individual um, focus points or mm -hmm. urban areas. So I was just wondering whether there's some like deliberate push to make it... Mm. Uh, so that accommodates rural mapping as well. Hmm. Yeah, well, I'll think about that. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, hi there. I, I'm from Canada, so they have tons and tons of, re of reasonable but somewhat excessive rules around drone flying in, in domestic areas as they do in England. I don't know what they're like here, but have you come up against this sort of problem in your work? Uh, and how do you navigate that? Um, well, so drone enthusiasts can fly 
where they want, when they want, um, within reason. So they have to fly under 400 feet. And um, so actually, that's why I'm really targeting this population, because they have the most freedom. Um, and I kept putting Cartman because there's a hilarious uh, South Park episode about drone flying. But uh, this is a population that has the most freedom. Once you start getting paid for it, if you're a government agency, then there are all kinds of restrictions for drone flying. But the enthusiasts, um, as far as I understand it in the US right now, they have the most freedom. So uh, if, yeah, go fly. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thanks, Dr. Ricker.